Hello and welcome. I'm Desiree Jones. What if we could learn directly from those who have spent the great majority of their lives studying specific chronic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, and many others? That is precisely the objective behind the interviews presented here, in which I interview some of the world's top scientists in the field of public health and chronic disease prevention. This project is entitled The State of Our Health in the U.S. and Globally, What Some of the World's Top Scientists Think. It is intended as a valuable educational resource in the interest of furthering public health. Our first interview is with Dr. William Dietz, who is one of the world's foremost experts today in the field of child and adolescent health. Dr. Dietz is the Director of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, Georgia. And prior to his appointment at the CDC, he was Professor of Pediatrics at the Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Dietz has published very widely and has received numerous awards for his contributions and research in the field of child and adolescent health. Listen carefully, as in this interview he highlights six specific strategies that we can use to proactively address the overweight and obesity epidemic among America's youth and children today. In this interview, he also discusses briefly CDC's other critical initiatives toward obesity prevention. Welcome, Dr. Dietz, and thank, thank you, you. It's thank good you to be for here. joining us. Uh, let me start by asking you a little question uh, with respect to getting a little perspective regarding the obesity and overweight problem here in the United States. In uh, January, we had a paper in the Journal of American Medical Association that indicated that obesity levels may be leveling off a little bit, and that from 1980 to 2000, they increased very rapidly, whereas over the last 10 years, it looks like we may have a little bit of a promising trend. Um, is it a little premature to be optimistic about that? What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's true that uh, between 1980 and about 1999, 2000, uh, there was about a threefold increase in the prevalence of childhood obesity. Right. Um, since 1999, 2000, there has been a, a no significant increase mm -hmm. in the prevalence of childhood obesity. That's true for girls, it's true for boys, it's mm -hmm. true for children who are overweight, which is a body mass index between the 85th and 95th percentiles. It's true for obese children, a BMI greater than 95th percentile. Mm -hmm. um, the only group that for whom it is not true are 6 to 19 year old boys whose BMI is greater than the 97th percentile, one criteria for severe obesity. Right. So for most of the population, uh, the prevalence is stable. For boys, the prevalence of severe obesity seems to be increasing. The other interesting observation is that it's flat for all three major ethnic groups in both genders. So African Americans, Mexican Americans, Caucasians mm -hmm. are flat. We still see the disparities in right. obesity so that there's a greater prevalence of obesity among Mexican American boys and African American girls. Mm -hmm. But overall it's flat. Well, I'm curious. We saw uh, higher rates in 6 to 19-year-olds, boys, and they were primarily white kids. I'm um, curious, what do you think may be accounting for that? I, I really don't know. I, I think it's a fundamental question, but it's very important because, in my view, severe obesity is not likely to respond to the policy and environmental initiatives that we have okay. underway. Okay. That for those children and adolescents, I think a clinical solution is going to be required. Um, let me ask you on the policy matter. Um, a lot of people think that sometimes simple home-based initiatives can be very useful. In other words, families sort of teaming up together a little bit to, to eat better and have a healthier lifestyle. Do you believe that a policy or public health doing this on a larger scale is oftentimes more effective, or is there really a place for each? Do we need mm -hmm. to balance that out? Well, 17 percent of the pediatric population is obese. Another 15 percent are overweight. Right. Um, that is a problem that's not going to respond to a clinical solution. Hmm. That the prevalence of childhood obesity, the rising prevalence of childhood obesity is also not a consequence of genetic changes in the population. Hmm. These were changes in the environment that produced it. And we think that there are at least six important strategies that, that we need to employ okay. broadly. Physical activity, breastfeeding, hmm. fruit and vegetable intake, reduced sugar sweetened beverage intake, reduced television viewing, and reduced intake of high energy foods, fast foods and high right. energy density right. snacks. Um, and, um, but it's true that people need to make the right choices. But in order to make the right choices, they need to have those choices that they can make. Mm -hmm. So you can't very well advise an inner city family living in a neighborhood without supermarkets to increase right. their fruit and vegetable intake. 
you can't very well convince a family of a, of a child who um, needs to be more active to be more active if they're not places for that child to play or if it's unsafe for that child to walk to school. Right. So we see these strategies, the, the strategies the that are going to be necessary to address those behaviors mm -hmm. in a much broader policy context. Well, um, you talked about convenience and availability. A lot of times people are thinking that even though their you know, school lunch quality maybe has improved, parents tend to think that the mainstream courses are still pizza or macaroni and cheese or chicken nuggets and so on. Uh, is there really room for some kind of a radical change where people might get local vendors to supply mm -hmm. fresh fruits and vegetables for students? Has there been some initiative in that direction? One of the most, um, the most important, uh, the, the most important factor which is going to influence the child's lunch is the child nutrition reauthorization bill. Mm -hmm. uh, embedded in that bill are standards for the foods that are served in schools, as right. well as standards for the foods that are served outside of the school lunch, which okay. are known as competitive foods. Okay. Um, and those are a, a real problem because most of the time those foods are like ice cream or cookies or other sure. things that don't meet the dietary guidelines. Right. One of the interesting things about the school meals is even though they, ha they really get bad press, it's been shown that children who eat the school meals have a healthier profile in terms of their nutrient intake than mm -hmm. children who do not. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of room for improvement, improvement in definitely. terms of, of making more fresh fruits and vegetables available or more fruits and vegetables available in general, both mm -hmm. frozen and fresh. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't lower the fat and certainly we need to lower the sodium in those mm -hmm. meals. But overall, um, the, the child nutrition reauthorization bill is going to go a long way towards doing that. The other important bill, the other important piece of the child nutrition reauthorization bill is its impact on a program known as the child and adult care food program. Okay. This is the program that supplies foods to children in child care. So it has the same impact in early childhood as potentially the school feeding programs do in older children. So this is something you're thinking about nationwide that we're going to implement in schools? Yes. Well, this, you know, if this bill passes and, okay. it, and it's, um, it's been voted out of committee, but it's awaiting passage. Okay. If that bill passes in its current form, it's going to have a very important positive impact on the nutrition of school children. And the main uh, outcome will be improvement in the actual quality of foods That's correct. that are served to the children. Yep. And do you still believe there's an issue with competing foods? For example, a lot of parents tend to say, well, even though there are fruits and vegetables available, or salads, for example, available, if there is, you know, ice cream also, well, naturally, kids are going to go for that. Uh, does that, you know, does that ever come up, or is that an well, issue that's being dealt with? and that's with? exactly what I was talking about, right. that, that the food, many of the foods you're describing are not part of the school lunch pattern, but right. are com called competitive foods. Right. They're outside that pattern, right. and children have the potential to buy those foods. Um, there is language that in, in the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Bill that would hold competitive foods to the same standards hmm. of the dietary guidelines that other foods must adhere to. Okay, very good. Uh, Dr. Dietz, tell us a little bit with respect to uh, how obesity and overweight might affect uh, children as they get older. Mm -hmm. For example, we know that a lot of uh, kids who are obese tend to continue being obese as they get older. And uh, recently, Diabetes Care uh, published a paper uh, with respect to how diabetes is going to double to 44.1 million by 2034 and U.S. costs up around 336 billion to deal with diabetes. And because diabetes and obesity are so closely interrelated, there is a huge issue with respect to this. And not just uh, diabetes. We know that you know, obesity is linked to higher rates of heart disease, cancer. What can we do in terms of increasing uh, awareness, or are there initiatives in place mm -hmm. that are you know, building more awareness about that overweight and obesity causes problems that may be lifelong? Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly true that obesity is responsible for a huge burden of chronic diseases. Right. There's almost no system in the body that is not affected by obesity. Right. Uh, and the major diseases that are a consequence of obesity are cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the the, the study in diabetes care. There was another study that came out of CDC in, mm -hmm. in 2000, published in JAMA, mm -hmm. which suggested, actually, there was another study that came out of CDC that suggested that one out of every three children born in the year 2000 would develop type 2 diabetes or diabetes mm -hmm. during their lifetime. Wow. That's an enormous cost. It is. Um, approximately, we published, we published a paper last July which mm -hmm. showed that about $150 billion a year was attributable to obesity hmm. and its related That's diseases. Incredible. That's about 10% of the national health care budget. Hmm. And um, 
obese children who go on to become obese adults tend to have more severe obesity as adults. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that severity predicts costs, they're, those children who go on to become obese adults may be contributing a disproportionate amount of that budget. Right. And, um, so con and it's, this administration recognizes that control of obesity is an essential element of the control of medical costs. So initiatives like the First Lady's Let's Move initiative, mm -hmm. which addresses physical activity, schools, access to healthy foods, uh, giving parents, empowering parents to make right. decisions, all of those elements are going to likely contribute and to improving the level of obesity in the population. You know, um, Dr. Dietz, my work has to do a lot with understanding the first, what I call the first or primary causes of disease. And uh, I'm curious, in the Western world, especially here in the U.S. and Europe, now in Australia too, globally, we're seeing that the Western nations, and now the newly westernizing nations like China and India, are starting to see um, you know, the same patterns, high rates of obesity. And we know it's because of uh, you know, reduced activity and, and perhaps you know, more energy-dense foods. But uh, in terms of the original genesis of this problem, what are your thoughts on why the Western world seems to have taken the brunt of this problem? I wish we knew more about the causes. I mean, we, we know that almost everything in the food environment has changed. And we also know that children are a lot less active today right. than they were 30 years ago when most children walked to school uh, mm -hmm. rather than were driven or, or taking the bus. I think mm -hmm. that we need to invest in what kinds of measures can we take to, to reduce <laughs> this epidemic. <laughs> yes. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, improving child care settings, you mm -hmm. know, focusing on television viewing, eliminating sugar-sweetened beverages, right. uh, getting uh, more uh, fruits and vegetables in those, those settings, doing the same in schools, making communities more livable so they foster physical activity, that right. they are safe for children to play outdoors, uh, that there are grocery stores or access to healthy foods in, in okay. underserved communities. Um, reducing the access to uh, fast food in schools and other settings. Those are strategies which go a long way, I think, towards reducing the risk factors associated with obesity. Mm -hmm. Now, it's true, one of the challenges is that we, we need to understand what mix of those strategies and what intensity of those strategies mm -hmm. is likely to reduce obesity. But that's where we ought to be putting our, our emphasis. emphasis. On.